Just a young gun with a quick fuse. I was uptight. Wanna let loose. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 10 of KN Chats. My name is Eric Mojica, your host for the show. So today our guest is Emily Roder. She is a physical therapist and is also certified in concussion management. And so Emily kicks it off talking about just the, the basics of becoming a physical therapist, the educational stuff, and all the clinical work that comes into it, and the day-to-day -day operations. And she also dives deep into the specialty that she's recently gotten into, and that is working with patients who are dealing with concussions or concussion-like symptoms. And so one of the things that really stood out to me in my discussion with Emily was talking about the vestibular ocular testing that they do with their patients dealing with concussions. And so I made a really good connection in our discussion because um, just a couple days prior to that, I met up with Justin Pryor over at BioFit in Overland Park, Kansas. And so what the vestibular ocular system basically is, is that our eyes, ears, and brain are connected and are giving each other some kind of feedback to bring awareness to what our body is doing in space. And so when you think about a concussion um, or somebody dealing with a concussion, um, the brain can sometimes uh, kick up some of these symptoms such as blurred vision, dizziness, confusion, um, sleepiness, a variety of things that's all varied case to case. Um, but basically uh, one of those tests that I got to do with Justin was using a pen and then locking into the eyes turning the head and trying to lock the eyes onto that pen. And so what happens is when you bring exercises like that for our eyes and our brain to make a connection, um, some of these symptoms can get kicked up and that is a useful tool for physical therapists like Emily to be able to see how the person is responding because you're not going to have somebody start with a lot of exercises and running and lifting weights. You got to start with the basics. And so um, just kind of testing how those eyes, ears, and brain are making that connection and seeing how the body responds to that. On another note, if you're a personal trainer or looking for some continuing ed units, you should check out Mike G's ACM 360 Pro. Mike G was on episode five of KN Chats. And in that episode, he talked about corrective exercise and the strategies to better assess clients and implement more effective training programs. The exercise therapy specialist certification course is online and it is approved by the Academy of Sports Medicine and the Athletics and Fitness Association of America. For more information, visit their website at acm360pro.com. And if you go to the Can Chats website, you can find some links to that. And if you send us a message via email or on social media from Instagram, Facebook, or our YouTube accounts, um, you can ask us for a promo code and you can get up to $200 off on the certification courses from ACM 360 Pro. So without further ado, let's start the show. Episode 10 of KN Chats begins right now. All right, and today we have our guest, Emily Roder. She is a physical therapist and she's out here locally in Kansas City. So uh, hi, Emily, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Eric. Right on, so, uh, so you're a physical therapist and I uh, just kind of wanted to get things started with you telling us about uh, your education and all the clinical work you've done and just overall your whole career so far. Sure. Well, I started out, um, I've been a therapist for, let's see, what year is it? 2012, for about seven years now. Um, so I went to uh, Concordia University in Seward, Nebraska to do my undergrad. And then right after that, I got into KU Med for my physical therapy. So that's an additional three years after that. Um, during that three years, we have about two years of coursework and then a year total of clinical work. Um, so right after I graduated there, took my exam, passed that, and I started working at an outpatient clinic out in Belton. I was there for a year and a half or so. And then since then, I've been working at Research Medical Center at their Brookside location at an outpatient clinic there. Right on. And so... Um, what was your major in starting off in your undergrad? I majored in exercise science and then I minored in chemistry and biology. I kind of started off in the more science realm and then decided that I wasn't getting enough of the exercise based stuff. So I kind of switched over to exercise science so I could get some more of the biomechanics and exercise physiology stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so what can you tell us is like the biggest difference between exercise science and kinesiology? Because they're, they're really related, but in your experiences, what, what do you see that's overall different? Um, I mean, that's a good question. Where, where I majored at as far as like, it was basically the same thing, exercise science, kinesiology. So it was a very young major at the college that I went to. Um, so I would say 
Jeez, that's a good question. Um, I mean, it, there's a lot of stuff you can do with either one of them, really. Um, exercise science, I guess, is more, would have more to do with maybe some biomechanical stuff, looking at more of like the science behind exercise, thus exercise science. <laughs> yeah, I've always kind of understood it as like, you need to have a better understanding for like things going on at the cellular level. So yes. that's why chemistry and biology is so much more emphasized. Not that it's not in kinesiology, but you have to understand, you know, a lot of the bioenergetics of what's going on with exercise. And I think- for sure. That yeah, understanding of what, not just like what muscles to use and all that, but how the muscles are reacting to what you're doing. And um, yeah, like you said, at the bio or biocellular level. Uh -huh. So as a physical therapist, what do you do? I work at an outpatient clinic, meaning um, I see I, I see a variety of patients. I've seen someone as young as eight years old, someone as old as about 95. Um, at the clinic that we work at, um, a range of diagnoses. Um, sometimes, most of the time, people associate PT with something like you had a surgery, a knee replacement, hip replacement, something like that, and then you go to therapy. Um, it doesn't have to be just after a injury or a surgery. We see a lot of people um, like they're trying to prevent falls or prevent injuries. If you're, you know, an older population, trying to build up strength, endurance, um, something like that. Uh, in Missouri, how you come see me is Missouri is one of three states now that has no form of direct access for physical therapists, meaning you have to have a script from a doctor, or a physician's assistant, nurse practitioner in order to come see me first. Um, in Kansas, that is the what, a few years ago, they got a form of direct access. So you can see a PT, I think it's for like 10 to 14 days, something like that, before you have to go back to the doctor. Um, in Missouri, they just got a bill proposed and it's not, I don't think it's being heard on the floor yet, but it's in the committee that the next step is to be heard in the Senate floor. So hopefully that gets passed so we can have some form of direct access. Um, but uh, as far as like structure, once you come see me, so our initial evaluations are usually 45 minutes to an hour. We kind of get to know each other, um, find out what's going on. Generally, when I get the script from a doctor, it'll say something like, hip pain, knee pain, you know, something not very specific. So then it's my goal to try and kind of figure out what specifically is going on with the patient. Um, that's why I really like that we get a whole hour to spend with the patient each time so we can really figure out um, what specifically is going on with that patient. And then I like to do a lot of kind of manual hands-on therapy kind of the first day, kind of get a feel for um, how the patient moves, um, exactly what's going on in the body. I'll usually give them a few exercises to start off with and then kind of depending on what we decide um, we want our goals to be, we'll see them anywhere from, you know, one to three times a week for, you know, it kind of depends four to six weeks, something like that kind of depends on what we find out. Mm -hmm. And so what are some of the assessments? I'm assuming that you go through a lot of like orthopedic tests. Mm -hmm. but, uh, is it, can you kind of go into that? What do you Sure. Do? Yeah. Sure. So um, initially, most of the time, you know, if it's a lower body injury, I'll, I'm kind of assessing you from the moment you walk in the door. So I'm looking at how your gait pattern is, what you look like when you're walking in. Um, we'll look at strength, whether that be upper body, lower body, we'll look at strength, um, range of motion. We'll do any special kind of orthopedic tests, see if there's anything wrong with the ligaments themselves, any tendons, anything like that. Because um, a lot of the time, most patients don't come in with like an MRI that says, hey, I, you know, tore my ACL, you know, do something. Um, usually it's like I said, just knee pain and we have to try and figure out. So we've got some special tests that we can look at to see if we see anything um, in ligaments themselves. Um, I'll usually go and put my hands on the patient, look at their flexibility, see how their joints themselves are moving. Um, go through some functional tests, watch them walk, watch them do stairs. If it's a younger patient, watch them, you know, jump, do some running, something like that. Usually it's, I, I want to get at what, what, um, what functional things you're having problems doing at home. 
So then a lot of times they say, you know, oh, I have a problem going from sitting to standing. Great, let's watch you do it. Let's see what you're doing. Um, you know, having problems with the stairs, having problems with walking. Um, we can do some special tests. Sometimes if they complain of um, like endurance issues, we'll do something that's called the six minute walk test. So we have them go walk for six minutes, see how far we can get. We'll look at heart rate, look at blood pressure um, and see if we then um, a lot of those tests then become our goals. So we say, hey, we went this far the first time in a month. Our goal is to go this far. So something that really comes to mind after you kind of talking about all that is just like, I think that a lot of people who don't understand what physical therapy is, is that they'll rely on just going to the doctor and then hoping the doctor just says, hey, take this pill <laughs> or, right? And like, yep, oh, you for sure. a couple of these treatments. And so um, just really admire what physical therapists do and just how in depth that you can help someone. So for sure. It crosses a lot of paths of personal training. Yeah. Uh, what, what are the biggest differences that you say from both a legal standpoint and then just the, the practicality of what we do? Between an athletic trainer and or the a personal trainer and a PT? Yeah. Um, so I would say a lot of it is we 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 can give what we call a physical therapy diagnosis so it's a little bit different than the diagnosis that your doctor might give you but it's based on kind of our assessment that we find out um like i said going through the special tests looking at strength range of motion all that stuff and most pts will spend you know 45 minutes to an hour with you doing their initial assessment and we're looking at you know that one or two joints most of the time when you go to the doctor they're looking at you know whole body kind of stuff and they're in there for 15, 20 minutes, which is what they're supposed to do. And then they send you to us and we've got that, you know, more time to spend with you to find out kind of detailed what's what's going on. And I think, um, again, I don't know, like all of the, the schooling and stuff you guys have gone through. I know personal trainers do a lot as far as like musculature and they know all about, you know, they can name all the muscles, know all that kind of stuff. Um, and we get a little bit more in depth, I think, into maybe what's going on. Um, you know, more with some ligaments and some joints and some more. Like, do they have a joint restriction in one area? Are they, you know, need to work on flexibility in another area? Um, and we I'm trying to think legally, I'm not sure what we go through. Um, before you can become uh, licensed to be a physical therapist, you have to take a national exam. So you have to pass that and then that's good for any state. Most states then require you to do some sort of little jurisprudence thing to look at, you know, what the specific laws are um, in each uh, state as far as what you can and can't do in physical therapy. But um, I think, uh, I don't know if that answers your question enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, just one of the things that just from my understanding is that you can diagnose people, right? Yeah. As for someone like myself as a personal trainer, I can only give recommendations. And when I see someone who has a severe issue, I have to, you know, talk to the person and say, hey, I think that I should refer, you need to be referred gotcha. to. Yes. Uh, yeah, that is correct. Right on. And so um, what are the biggest challenges that you go through as a physical therapist with doctors so i think that you kind of touched on it before about how doctors only see patients for a short period of time and then mm -hmm. you get to do that so do you ever see any struggles like that just trying to get that communication process sometimes um most of the time we try to develop like a pretty good relationship with the physicians especially for getting a lot of referrals from them um and so the the majority of the physicians that i work with now um you know, know that we've gone through a lot of schooling and know that we're good about diagnosing all those musculoskeletal things. So most of the time they'll kind of refer to us or defer to us as far as um, diagnosing stuff. Um, sure, sometimes I've run into some problems. So you, you learn how to kind of phrase yourself when you're talking to physicians as far as making sure that you're not saying like, this is definitely what it is. This is what I think it is. Like you just present your case, you present your evidence and be like, this is what I found when I saw the patient. This is where I think I should go with this. Um, and it's just about having a good re working relationship with the physicians that you're working with. Okay. And so um, you said that you've worked with athletes as well, right? Mm -hmm. And so what are the biggest differences that you find with the general population and athletes? Um, a lot of it is kind of what their end goal is. 
Um, so, you know, you have a patient come in and they're like, hey, I want to be able to get down on the floor and play with my grandkids, you know, versus if you have an athlete come in, they're like, I have to get back to my, you know, D1, D2, whatever it might be, sport, like just their, um, the, what level you're trying to get them back to is a little bit different. And sometimes their, their motivation can be different too. Like, you know, someone, sometimes athletes aren't always as forthcoming with you as far as what they're experiencing, what they're, you know, going through um, because they want to get back and do their sport. And so they're like, oh yeah, that didn't really hurt. I can do this. And so a lot of the time I really like to read my patient's faces because they're telling me one thing, but their face is telling me something else. So I'm like, you know, kind of, explain that to me like is that really how you feel and so that's where especially with my younger athletes I feel it's great it's good to get a um, good first impression with them and let them know that hey I'm on your side I'm trying to get you back as soon as we can but you have to be honest with me and let me know what's going on or else I'm not gonna be able to help you as well because I tell my younger patients all the time like um, you know think about where you are in your your stage of life like this seems like it's everything to you right now but we got to think long term too like we don't want to speed through this knee or hip or ankle or whatever it might be we don't want to speed through this and then set you up for you know, poor outcomes going forward um so that's a lot of the differences that i see is just like initial attitudes kind of thinking through things yeah and uh <laughs> speaking from experience i know that uh I've lied as well when I had some injuries. I mean, I pretty much lived my whole college career in the. <laughs> um, yeah. And as a personal trainer, I can kind of agree with with all that. Is um, obviously we work in different degrees of what we're trying to help people with. But sure. Yeah, definitely. It, it, I think that reading people's faces is definitely something that can get, really give it away for people. Uh -huh. <laughs> this episode of K and Chats is brought to you by All Star Chiropractic. Dr. Casey Berry is a chiropractor located in South Kansas City, providing chiropractic adjustments using a holistic approach to promote self-healing through the power of chiropractic. The power that made the body heals the body. For more information, visit www.allstarchiropractickc.com or call the office at 816-942-6066. That's 816-942-6066. All Star Chiropractic. And now back to the featured Kay and Chad's podcast. Right on. Um, so you've mentioned that you've been getting into some stuff with concussion protocols and stuff. So can you kind of tell us about that? Sure. So about, well, about three years ago, I had our, um, uh, one of our managers approach me and said that one of the physicians wanted to start a concussion program in our, on our campus. So he asked if anybody would be interested in working with any concussion patients and um, I did, nobody else popped up. So I was like, yeah, sure. Um, in eighth grade in the hurdles, I suffered a concussion and um, just thinking back to how I was treated or rather not really treated with that. Like I fell on the last or second to last hurdle. Somehow I ended up finishing that race and then didn't know my name at the end of the at the end of the race and still ran a race after that like that is totally not what would happen now and that wasn't you know wasn't that long ago so i started working with concussion patients about three years ago um a year ago i finished up a year-long certification in concussion management um which was a great program just kind of talked a lot about all the aspects that go along with concussions because there's just been so much more research and with the NFL, especially like bringing to light um, what happens with concussions and what can happen, you know, post concussions, post your career, all that stuff that all the NFL players are coming out with now. So it was something that was very interesting to me. Um, so typically I see concussion patients anywhere from two to as early as about two weeks after their injury. Um, I've seen patients up to a year afterwards. Um, it just kind of depends on what route they took to get to me, whether, you know, most people, even now the saying is still like, oh, I just, you know, got my bell rung or whatever, saw stars, I was fine after that. Um, but they're just finding out that there's so much more to concussions than that. So some common symptoms that I can help with are like if patients are experiencing dizziness or having headaches, um, neck pain, any balance issues, um, any, sometimes they'll have issues with reading. Um, they get dizzy, they get headaches, um, anything like looking at the computer, watching TV, that kind of stuff. Um, and so we take them through, again, usually with my concussion patients, I spend an hour to an hour and a half with them because those evals can take a while, especially if they're, you know, just had their concussion. Um,
in a couple different sessions. Um, and then it kind of depending on what we find, that's the fun thing that I like about concussions is, you know, one patient, one person can have the same injury that somebody else has and have completely different symptoms. And your brain heals so much differently that it's not like you broke your arm and then in six weeks it's going to be healed. Your brain just doesn't work that way. Um, which is another frustrating thing about concussions is that I can't tell somebody, you know, all right, six weeks from now you're going to be healed because your brain just doesn't work that way. Um, so that, again, is another frustrating but challenging slash kind of exciting thing for me when I work with concussion patients. So when you're working with concussion, and what tells you more? Is it like the testing stuff that you do, the CT scan? Like what do you really kind of lean on? So that's something there is not any imaging that can – diagnose a concussion so if someone goes in and has like a, a head injury and they do a ct or an mri all they're looking for is if there's any like excessive bleeding um, if that's the case then they're going to have to have some sort of other medical management um, but a concussion itself does not show up on a ct or an mri what you're looking for instead are like clinical tests um, <clears throat> so i do a little screen that's called a uh, vestibular ocular motor screen so it's looking at some eye movements um, kind of watching if they can follow a moving target see how your eyes move quickly from object to object um, see if you can keep your eye your your eyes focused on something when your head is moving um, looking at some balance stuff um, those are kind of the tests and then like their signs so if they have a headache if there's any dizziness um, extreme fatigue, um, any memory loss, those are the things that we look to to diagnose a concussion. So it's simply a clinical diagnosis. And so for those who aren't very familiar with the term, the vestibular ocular mm -hmm. type of training, um, and I, it's funny because I actually yesterday, I have a right here on my door, I have a, like some letters there. Uh -huh. And we did some tests yesterday with my girlfriend because she's been learning some stuff with that. Perfect. But, uh, so what is what is the overall stimulation that you're trying to create when you're going through those those exercises? Can you kind of explain what that is? Sure. So what we're trying to look at is so when when you get a concussion and people don't realize sometimes so you don't have to get hit in the head in order to get a concussion. You can have like a whiplash kind of effect. So you're you know that forward that quick forward backwards motion because your brain inside your body is not you know, it's not just a rigid structure. There's some movement that it has in there. So when that quick forward backwards motion, that causes uh, a chemical change in the brain. And so you get this, um, this influx of chemicals within your brain, which can then disrupt some of the connections, um, which is what causes some of those symptoms. So some of your dizziness and stuff like that. So the, your, your eyes, um, there's much more to your vision than just like your ability to see 2020. Um, so your eyes tell you a lot of different things. So that's why we look at, you know, seeing if your eyes can follow, can you, you know, can you follow my finger? Can you follow a moving target? This is looking at how your eyes are connecting with your brain, kind of seeing if that connection is good. Because sometimes with that influx of chemicals, that signal gets disrupted. And so those, um, they're really reflexes, so your eyes being able to follow the target, um, your eyes being able to stay focused on a target, those reflexes get disrupted. Um, and patients are always a little, um, they just kind of don't know what's going on. They're like, do they just know that I can't see? Um, and so you always, it's important to explain to them too that all this stuff that, you know, that people experience with concussions, all that stuff does get better. You know, through basically, if I see any of those, you know, if you can't follow a moving target, if your eyes can't come together to focus on an object, those then become your exercises. And then by working on those, then you kind of um, redevelop those pathways and your brain kind of wakes back up almost and figures out um, how to do all those things again. <laughs> right on. And so what is really happening to just the overall with the brain trying to follow that is it like a neurological thing that yes like losing a connection or it's you could i don't know that you'd really term it that you lost it it just gets slowed uh -huh. um, so because of the influx of chemicals that you have in your brain um usually you have a you know an even flow of ions going back and forth kind of these different um chemical elements that go back and forth to kind of keep your brain at a stable state um, but when you have this injury that happens, um, 
you get a, a change in that gradient. So instead of things kind of being even, you get more of one than the other. And then as that as your brain is trying to stable that out, um, then those connections get a little bit slowed. Um, so through rest, um, you know, initially it used to be, you know, when you get a concussion, stay in a dark room for a week, like don't do anything. That's not the case anymore. Research shows that you need some brain rest. They usually say like 24 to 48 hours of some brain rest. You don't have to do complete rest, but you want to give your brain a chance to heal because it did have an injury, you know, and then after that initial period, then you want to start slowly introducing things back to the brain because if you just keep it in a dark room, then it's not going to, it's not going to have to work to do anything. So it's not going to try and, you know, get better and relearn those pathways. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so when it comes to baseline levels, what are your resources to understand a person from where they were before and then how they're processing all the way yeah, through? Yeah, that can be, that can be hard sometimes because I don't, um, right now I don't work with like any specific teams or anything like that. So that's something that I don't always have. And if it's a patient that came in, you know, was in a car accident or I've had a patient that was walking in her office and a uh, stack of magazines fell on her head and she got a concussion from that. So like that, I'm not going to have a person's baseline. So there are kind of norm values, normal values for patients as far as like with all those eye tests, there's some normal stuff that you look for. Um, sometimes if I do have an athlete and they have an athletic trainer at their school, um, and they're in some sort of contact sport, most of the time their athletic trainers will do some sort of baseline testing with them, whether that be the um, the computerized test, and I'm drawing a blank on the name, the impact test, um, which is a computerized test um, that you have to take that looks at reaction time, attention span, um, memory. So a lot of the schools, even some of the high schools, um, are starting taking that test like you take that at the beginning of the year. Um, so that is another tool that we can use um, to kind of assess. Uh, I'm not uh, certified to give the impact test, but a couple of the physicians that I work with are. So they usually have that test administered and they can kind of help me interpret some of those. Um, I don't use that as a as a sole thing to get the patient back. Um, it's just kind of a tool that we use for, for everything. Um, but sometimes we have that, sometimes we don't. Um, so I, a lot of the time, just rely on kind of what the patient tells me. Um, you know, they're like, I used to be able to read for a half hour, 30 minute, you know, half hour to an hour, and I could read whatever, 50 pages, and now I can read five pages in 30 minutes. Um, so a lot of time that's kind of what I'll look for as far as baseline stuff. Um, as far as the balance stuff goes, um, look a lot at balance, like looking with um, feet together, eyes open, eyes closed. I have them stand on an unstable, like a foam pad. Um, and generally most people should be able to do that for 30 seconds without losing their balance. So that's kind of the baseline that I that I get for that. Um, and any of those tests, if any of them that we're doing, if they get any dizziness, if they get any headache, that's a positive sign, meaning that something's going on with that. So I look for once it gets to where they don't have any dizziness, they don't have any headache, then they're back to normal for them. Awesome. Because uh, I remember, from, so my freshman year, I had a net during batting practice that just the wind blew it down, hit me in the head. And so mm -hmm. um, I remember that initial part of the year, I took one of the, I think it was the impact test. Mm -hmm. Is that the one where all the shapes? Yeah. Are yeah. Out? So I have terrible memory already to start with. Uh -huh. so that test was just a nightmare. And so. Um, yeah. I which is why which is why I don't like to use that as like my only thing to say that they're back because some people just don't do well with those tests. Um, but then that's so the impact test is becoming more of a thing that people are using now and some athletes know that and they know that if they don't do well the first time that if they then have a concussion they don't do as well the second time then sometimes they can't tell that. Um, most good clinicians will be able to figure it you know, figure that out that they tried to, you know, bomb it the first time or whatever and use other things um, to get them back just besides just the impact test. Um, but I mean, it's still a good tool to have, Definitely. especially if you have, you know, nothing else. Yeah. And I had some teammates that, you know, they, they were giving me advice after that year. And they're like, yeah, make sure that you like do really bad on the first <laughs> part that way. In case you get concussed, you can get back uh -huh. quick. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, advice, that, but. yeah, that's where I say, like, especially with those with those athletes that you come in, like they they are going to want to get back out there, you know, even if they had a concussion, because sometimes 
those those symptoms are harder to deal with because it's not like you I keep going back to this. It's not like you have a broken arm and you can see it and, you know, somebody knows you're injured. Most of the time you look fine, um, but you can tell that you don't feel fine. And so that's a hard thing. We talk a lot about with my patients that concussion is an injury of loss. Like you don't realize, you know, all the things you're not able to do until you have that concussion. And then, you know, you lose a lot of things. You can lose a lot of things after having that concussion. So that's where it's important to have that good relationship with that athlete and tell them, hey, I'm on your side. You know, but if you don't tell me what's going on, this is your brain health we're dealing with here, you know, and we don't want to, we don't want to set you up for a bad time down the road. Mm -hmm. And so I got one more question on concussions sure. and it's more about the, the chronic symptoms. Like if mm -hmm. somebody's experienced symptoms, let's say six months up to a year, maybe even more than that. Um, <laughs> how do you approach that as far as, you know, with all these different tests and training and yeah. Uh, just really out of our control is just something that we can kind of dig into. Yeah, no, I've seen patients that have been almost a year after their injury. And honestly, most of the time it's because they didn't know what was going on. So, you know, they were in some sort of accident or something happened. You know, you go to the emergency room, they tell you, they may or may not tell you you have a concussion. They say you hit your head and sometimes, you know, initially those symptoms don't pop up. And then it's, you know, a day or two days later, and then you start feeling something. Um, and then maybe you go to your, um, you know, you follow up with your primary care physician and they're like, you know, it'll get better, it'll get better. Because generally speaking, most concussion symptoms resolve within four to six weeks. Um, but it's not uncommon for those symptoms to last a little bit longer. And so um, most of the time, the people that come in six months to a year afterwards just didn't have the resources. They didn't know that they could get better. Um, so I will still take them through those same tests, still look at their eye stuff, look at all that stuff. And most of the time it's kind of those, that that vestibular, the ocular, the your kind of inner ear balance mixed with your eyes, that's usually where their lasting symptoms are coming from. And most of the time because of that, they're experiencing headaches or they're experiencing some dizziness. Um, so I have had success treating those patients six months to a year out. Um, kind of doing the same stuff. It might take a little bit longer because their body has been compensated for what's going on. So our bodies are really great about compensating and sometimes we don't even realize it. So sometimes if, you know, if we move our head a couple times to the left really quickly um, and we get dizzy, then our body's like, hey, like, I don't like that feeling, I'm gonna stop doing that. So then without even realizing it, you stop moving your head to the left. And so then sometimes those those symptoms might diminish, but then they seem to just pop up at random times, but it's just when your body forgotten, you turn your head to the left again, but you still have those symptoms. So what we see through our exam is that I'm able to figure out um, kind of those movements that your body has probably been not doing for a while because you get symptoms with it. Um, and I've still had, you know, patients that have the majority of their symptoms resolved after a while, even though it's been six months to a year afterwards. Awesome. So a question. Therapy and my line of work, I've actually gotten to meet a lot of trainers, different backgrounds and stuff. And so I have heard this notion that physical therapists have an inability to fix people because of protocols. And so um, it was that true in the past is it something that still happens today. Can you kind of explain to us a little bit of, of the realities of that? Sure. Um, I mean, honestly, really the only time I use a quote unquote protocol would be like after a surgical something. So after a hip replacement or knee replacement, sometimes the certain surgeons will have a like a generalized protocol that they like to use. Um, and I mean, I would say most surgeons, Again, it depends on the relationship that you have with the surgeons that you're working with, but most of the time they kind of defer to the PT and they're like, you know, hey, do what you need to do. And that's where, um, I don't know, I kind of tried to take the philosophy. So even if I've seen, you know, 100 different knee replacements, I still approach each patient and try to give them a unique experience because each person is going to bring in their own, you know, background, their own different things that they have going on. They all got to that knee replacement in a different way. Um, so if you just give everybody the same exercises with each knee replacement, like you're not always going to get the same results because every patient is different. You know, maybe this patient has 
had a bad knee for 10 years and they've been walking differently and then they've thrown off their left side so you also need to strengthen their left side um so that's something that i like i said i don't i don't approach everybody in like this cookie cutter fashion yeah. uh, i think it's important to um to really look at the patient and kind of figure out where their strengths and weaknesses are and then tailor the program towards them um and i i do that with with all my patients and i think um people who have had that experience kind of like with every profession there's there's good pts and there's bad pts and um just in everything you know so it's unfortunate if someone has experienced that but in with all the pts that i've worked with i think they all try and get that you know that patient first um mentality where you want to look at the patient and see what's going on with them most of the time you know i'll kind of look at the script and be like okay it says knee pain but then let's kind of figure out what's going on because this patient might say the pain's in the knee but then we realize it's actually referring from their back um so at this point then unfortunately in missouri we have to go back if the script says knee we have to go back and get a script for the back um but again if you have that good working re relationship with your physician then it's not a hard call you know you say i went through my evaluation it looks like this pain in the knee is referring from the back. We're going to go ahead and treat the back. Most of the time they're like, yeah, that's fine. You know, you yeah. saw what you want. Because I had a patient come in, you know, this was just a few weeks ago and had pain that was going all the way down the arm and everything. And the script had said shoulder pain. And we go through this evaluation and we find that, no, it's actually coming from the neck. It's a nerve that's, pain, that's you know, sending pain down the down the arm. And like, but I don't have pain in my neck. Well, that's that's okay that doesn't always happen um, so yeah we find out that then you know it's actually the neck so then we'll treat the neck um, because that's where the it's a, just a the radiating symptoms are coming from um, so I would say in general that's not a that's not a great statement I don't know how it's been I mean I've been a therapist like I said for seven years so I can attest to you know um, how it used to be or whatever but um, I think most BTs now and that's kind of why we made this push towards direct access because um, all the all the PT programs now are all doctorate programs. Um, so we go through, you know, seven total years of uh, schooling um, and they really focus on the, the differential diagnosis, like really diagnosing what's going on. Um, so, you know, getting to that level, trying to find out what's going on um, so that we can find out this patient who comes in and says it's shoulder pain, it's really coming from the neck. Um, and so, um, that's something that the physician doesn't always see just because that, you know, they have their 10 to 15 minutes and that's where we come in and we have that hour and we have that time to kind of tease out what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the ultimate, I think the ultimate system to be able to help people is that, you know, you have your doctors who are very good at diagnosing and identifying problems. For sure. You have another group of people, physical therapists who can help people now understand where these symptoms are coming from and how we not only uh, how can we not only fix them, but also do the things that can help us prevent them from happening? Yeah, yeah. and then well, we've had, yeah, we've had enough schooling to like, um, if we see something that's just not right, like we can't, I can't reproduce their pain with any movement. I can't find any pattern to it, anything like that. Um, you know, it's our, we'll send them back to the doctor and be like, hey, you know, I think something else is going on. I think you need to go, you know, get another scan. And if we have those, what we call kind of red flags that pop up that, that just don't fit the patterns that we see, we send them back to the doctor and say, you need to get some more testing done. <clears throat> awesome. Um, so more personal questions here. Uh, sure. Who are your greatest influences and mentors? Um, yeah, I always think about that question. So I, I kind of always go back to, so my senior year of high school, at the end of the first quarter of our first game of basketball, I fell, or I don't even know, I didn't even fall. I was just standing there and went down and ended up tearing my ACL. Um, so I had to go through like four to six months of therapy at that point. Um, up until then, I thought for whatever reason, I wanted to be a lawyer because I said I'd like to argue and watch Law and Order. That was not not my thing. <laughs> um, but then I had to go through therapy and I've really always thought back to my therapist who worked with me because most of the time she would do all the exercises with me, um, which just got me, you know, was much, I was much more motivated because who likes to, you know, do the, you're hurt and you have to do these stupid exercises by yourself. Like it's always nice to work out with someone else, which I'm sure, you know, you noticed that with some of your, your clients too. Um, because who wants to suffer alone? Um, so that was always fun that she did that. And she got me back um, in four months. I was able to go to the last two meets of track, which was really my sport. And she had torn her ACL before, so she knew what I was going through. And she was just really able to empath empath 
empathize with me, um, which I, I really liked. And she was really the one who got me thinking, hey, like, I think this PT is what I want to do. You know, I like working out. I like working with people. I like helping people. Um, so she is the one that I always kind of think back to as far as like what what got me into this profession in the first place. Um, and then as far as influences now, I have I've worked with a lot of great therapists and I think it's um, it's nice to have a group of colleagues that you that you can you know call if you need to like I still keep in touch with you know five or six of my classmates from PT school um, and are always bouncing ideas off of each other um, which is awesome just to have that that connection still awesome and uh, where can people find you on social media any contact information for any students out there maybe some people might need to work with you um, contact information Sure. Um, so my uh, email address is just my last name, Rotert, which is R-O-T-E-R-T, -E Emily, E-M-I-L-Y, at gmail.com. Um, that's probably the best way to get a hold of me. Right now, I don't do a, a ton of stuff on social media and that, but um, my email address would be the best thing to, to reach me at, and you can always shoot me an email, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Right on, Emily. Well, thank you for taking the time to do the show. Thank you. Awesome, and uh, I'll be I'll be in touch with you. Perfect, sounds good. All right, talk to you later. All right, see ya. Bye. And that concludes our interview with Emily Rodert. If you'd like to contact Emily about physical therapy, you can contact her at her email at rodertemily at gmail .com. Thank you for listening to the show, and remember to subscribe and follow on YouTube, SoundCloud, and the iTunes podcast app. All episodes are available on the Kane Chats website at kanechatspodcast.wordpress.com. Kane Chats is an educational podcast connecting our listeners to professionals in the field of kinesiology and exercise science. Subscribe, like, follow, and most importantly, share the podcast with your network of sports, health, and fitness enthusiasts to continue the Kane Chats mission to share free content and valuable information from all our professional guests. We have more shows coming your way, so stay tuned. This is Eric Mojica signing off. Until next time, this is Kay and Chats.